So, uh, last Sunday after worship, I lost my voice. And for about three days, I couldn't talk until about, you know, Thursday, Friday. Around then, I started to be able to talk again, though, as you can tell, not too loud. Um, it made me really grateful for um, the opportunity to learn something new. As I was whispering to converse with some people, I noticed even the quietest and mildest person from our shepherd's table, somebody I think of as very quiet and soft-spoken, she was talking over me at certain points. And I thought, oh my goodness, it has nothing to do with intentional rudeness. This is the least rude person in the world, but I just realized, my goodness, with a loud and booming voice, a Baptist preacher voice like I've normally got, I must do that to people all the time and not even realize it. Because I know she didn't even realize she was doing it to me. So, uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, my apologies uh, if I start talking over you ever. It's, it's certainly not my intention to do that. Uh, but I thank God for this new perspective he's given me, even though it's been extremely inconvenient for me. And uh, I know it's made things even worse yet for uh, Valerie, with whom I haven't been able to converse as much as I'd like to um, over the past week. So, uh, Lord, I pray that you would help me be able to speak. But uh, as you've helped me to learn this week, I, I, speaking isn't really worth doing unless it's for your glory and for your honor and praise. So, Lord, help me to praise you and glorify you today with the reading of your word and the proclamation of your gospel. Amen. And, you know, uh, this morning, some of you who arrived right at the cutoff limit, right before we about closed the door ordinarily and locked people out, uh, <laughs> you might have realized I was out on the street uh, this morning before the service talking with some people out there that normally don't come in here. Uh, that was in response to a woman's prayers last night at the Dolgeville Revival. Uh, there was a woman, Eileen, who is from Mohawk, that was praying that the pastors of churches would regain their voice. And I thought, oh my goodness, is she praying for me? And then she followed up with, and Lord, help them to not just use their voice in an echo chamber of people that agree with them, but take them out of their congregations and put them in places that need to hear your word. And so uh, if I've got a voice today um, and I seem like I'm wandering and preaching to people that aren't, if I sound like I'm not preaching to the choir, that's why... <laughs> Uh, that's what brought me outside this morning, and I think uh, I should probably do a little bit more of that. So, for those of us that are gathered here today, though, my commitment is no less to help you to uh, have renewed joy in your faith by telling you the same old story once again. And our scripture takes us today to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. So, let us hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. 
Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he answered, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight. And out the, at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this very moment, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul, and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks be to God. George Martin wrote in his book, Clash of Kings, when you tear out a man's tongue, you are not proving him a liar. You are telling the world that you fear what he might say. So I wonder, what does Paul fear that Christians are saying that People like Stephen are stoned. That Paul enters the homes of Christians and drags them bound and gagged for prisons in Jerusalem. Paul and really the entire secular world and the world that is in rebellion against God are terrified that the claims of Christianity might just be true. Think about that for a moment. Persecution comes from a place of fear that what Christians are saying might be true. Think about it. Does anyone persecute UFO conspiracy theorists? flat earth conspiracy theorists? No. They've got these crazy theories and people are just like, let them say what they think. They'll reveal what lunacy they're preaching as soon as you hear them. Nobody fears that what they're saying might be true. But when people like Peter, people like Kyle, and people like all of you say that there is no other name under heaven given among men but Jesus Christ by which men are to be saved. People hear that and say, oh my God, what if that's true? That's where persecution comes from. It does something to people. It changes their perception of the world and how they engage in their daily life if that claim to truth is valid. So what exactly is the claim to truth that Christianity makes? And what is at stake for Paul and many others if these claims are true, as I hope we all believe they are? That's what I hope to draw our attention to today. The claims of truth that Christianity makes and what is at stake for people like Paul that are in rebellion to God. As I said, Peter preached on Pentecost that Jesus died. He was raised from the dead and glorified. 
And this happened in accordance with Scripture, according to God's plan, because all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, and all who believe in Christ are reconciled to God through his work on the cross. Notice how often the word all is used in that profession of faith, pretty standard profession of faith. You see, not only do Christians believe that the gospel is true, they believe it's true for all, for everyone. That means that Christians or followers of the way, as Luke calls it in Acts chapter 9 here, is going to be by nature a converting and proselytizing religion. Because Christians believe that the gospel is not just true for them, but true for everyone, it means that the most loving thing we can do is live and speak and act in a way that persuades others to become Christians and have joy and assurance in faith in Jesus Christ. So, that's what Christians believe. That's the claim to truth that we make. And if this, if this gospel of salvation, reconciliation to God through faith apart from works is true, what is at stake for people like Paul? Well, I'll tell you what's at stake. All of Paul's religious achievements and credentials are nothing but garbage. As he says himself, I count everything as loss for the sake of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. Everything I once held dear, I count as loss. It means that his zealous persecution of Christians, which he thought was doing a service to God, was actually a direct action of rebellion against God and a persecution of Jesus Christ himself. His entire view of the world and himself has been overturned. And finally, it means that all of Paul's boasting in himself is going to need to die. He's going to need to find someone else to boast about if this gospel of reconciliation, apart from his works, is true. It means he's going to have no one he can boast in except boasting in who? Jesus Christ and him crucified. So today is the day when Jesus confronts Paul with this truth and something miraculous happens. Something nothing short of a miracle happens. You might think a blinding white light and Paul being thrown from his horse and a voice speaking to him is pretty miraculous in and of itself, and it is. But the truly miraculous part is what was happening that was unseen. Paul's heart was converted that day by a sovereign act of God. And Luke includes this account of Paul's conversion in this particular way, with these particular details, in order to increase the joy of your faith there are reasons why Luke recounted this tale of Paul's conversion. It's got everything to do with your life and your joy and faith. So that's furthermore what I hope to draw your attention to this morning. <clears throat> what are the details of this conversion? There's about three or four details of Paul's conversion that, are, that I think are important for us to understand. One, this was the 
conversion of a zealous rebel to God. It opens up in verse 1, chapter 9, verse 1, that Paul was breathing threats of murder against the disciples of Jesus Christ. Paul didn't come home after a long day of persecuting Christians and put his feet up in the air and say, oh, I can finally relax. Persecution of Christians was the air he breathed. It means he ate, slept, and drank persecution. He breathed persecution day and night. He dreamt about persecuting Christians. He got home, and all he could think about was persecuting Christians. It was the singular, all-consuming focus of his life. He was obsessed with persecuting Christians. And God converted him. If God can convert him, he can convert anyone. Secondly, Paul's conversion was sudden and unexpected. Luke says that he was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. He wasn't having some internal moral struggle. Uh, you know, I don't know if this is really the right thing to do or not. No. He says in his letters that he was perfectly happy and content and believing he was doing the best thing with his life up until the day he was converted. His conversion was instantaneous. Thirdly, his conversion was the act of sovereign intervention by Jesus Christ himself. It was not in response to anything Paul had done, requesting the conversion of his heart. He didn't say, Jesus, I'm doing wrong. I need you to come into my life and fix things. He wasn't even asking for it. Jesus came in with sovereignty into his life and took control. He said, go to Damascus, and there you'll hear what to do. Ananias himself objected, Lord, I can't go see Paul. I've heard about him and what he's doing. And Jesus said, I'm not asking you, Ananias. I'm telling you, go to Paul and do so and so, do such and such. And Luke focuses on these three particular details to give us one overarching hope and encouragement in our faith. That is, that Jesus Christ can act suddenly and effectively to convert anyone. Is that not great news? People, the worst, the worst sinners you can imagine, whether it's yourself or someone persecuting you, there is no sin beyond the redemption that Jesus Christ can work in their life at a surprising, unexpected moment. We can't look at somebody and say, there's someone ripe for conversion any more than we can look at anyone else who looks like the perhaps least likely candidate for conversion. I tell you what, I was just talking with a guy out on the street before the service started and he had some very strange things to say <laughs> about what he believes to be the truth of the universe and how he's arrived at these conclusions. You won't ever hear them from this pulpit, I guarantee you. But I can't not go to him. I can't not talk to him. Conversion of anyone is possible, even someone with crazy far-out ideas like him. And it'll happen exactly when... God determines it to be true. It's up to us to not lose faith and be discouraged because we bang our heads against hearts of stone day in and day out. That's what it feels like sometimes. We're banging our head against hearts of stone, and it's true. We'll never soften people's hearts with the proclamation and the witnessing of the gospel that we carry out, but we can be assured that the work is effective 
for what God intends it to do. When we love our enemies, when we bless those who persecute us, what's the Bible say? We heap burning coals upon their heads. And those burning coals will do one of two things. Either it will cause them to burn with contrition and repentance, or it will serve as judgment of burning fire if they don't. Either way, it's going to do exactly what God intends it to do. So we can't be discouraged and lose hope in the work that we do as witnesses. So if it is true that there is no one beyond the reach and saving redemption of Jesus Christ, if that incredible news is true, what is at stake for Paul? What does he fear? Well, as I said, he can't boast in anyone but, him, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And if that's true for him, what are the implications for us? And how we do mission as a church? Well, one, it means that persecution, whether it's coordinated bombings in Sri Lanka on Easter morning against Christian martyrs, as they are now. They weren't asking to be martyrs, but they are. Whether it's that or other subtle ways of silencing the gospel, minimizing the name of Jesus Christ, distorting the word of God. I'm not talking about criticism of Christians. Someone calls you a jerk because you're a jerk, that's not persecution. That's, that's valid criticism. <laughs> I'm talking about minimizing the name of Jesus Christ, trying to erase the proclamation of the gospel from the world. That kind of persecution in any of its forms is actually a compliment to us. It means that they're actually afraid that what we're witnessing is true. And we can take that as a bit of a compliment, even if it's not intended as such. And second, it means that we can be a bold witness at any time. We should be a bold witness at any time and in all places because we never know when that person is on their road to Damascus, on the, way, on the highway to hell, that we might be in their life to be the effective witness that God has called us to be and that person finds the stairway to heaven. We never know when God might use our witness to change someone's life effectively like he did for Paul. <clears throat> and third, I just want to use a small specific example of how we do mission at this church. Some people have asked me about uh, the Mormon missionaries called elders that we have serving coffee, ironically, in our Shepherd's Table program. <laughs> They're on mission for the purpose of converting people to their religion. What are they doing serving in our Shepherd's Table program where we are trying to be witnesses of our faith? Well, Here's my take on it, and I hope you can understand it. If not, make this your own take on the situation. If there was any reason to fear that what they could say might be true, I wouldn't have them anywhere near here. But it is, as it is, I hope you do hear what they claim to be true. I hope you hear it. I hope you critically evaluate it and realize it for the lunacy that it is, even as you critically evaluate the claims to truth I'm making here, even as you critically evaluate the truth of the real, real gospel and find it to be absolutely true and assuring. So that's why they're here. It's because I'm not afraid that what they say is true. In fact, we have 
Baptists here on Thursday serving lunch. We're currently working with the Methodist Church and the Lutheran Church and the Episcopal Church and even those heretics in the Reformed Church of Mohawk <laughs> to organize a coordinated vacation Bible school this summer. And you know, I hope that in the midst of all of these different points of view, God will move in a sovereign and effective way to reveal his truth to the people that he has chosen to be instruments for himself. That his elect will ultimately have discernment and realize the truth and how great a news it is that there is no other name under heaven by which we are to be saved. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would use this proclamation of your gospel today to convert someone's heart. That whatever road they were on this morning, that you'll have taken this moment of pause for them to hear your gospel of Christ crucified, raised, exalted, and coming again. And that you will utterly transform their life. And for the rest of us, Lord, I pray that you would use this moment to reconstitute us, to encourage us, build us up, and strengthen us for the deadly and dangerous work of witnessing to Christ's resurrection. Even as we approach the bread and juice today, that you would meet us on the way, that even as you have already made us your own, you would help us to press on to make you our own as well. Amen. Just as a side note, I know this doesn't excite everybody like it excites me, but in studying the Greek this week, the word persecute that Jesus uses when he asks Paul is a word that means pursue when Violence is not implied. Jesus is asking Paul, why are you pursuing me? And I thought about that as I understood the range of meaning of that word, that there was nobody more obsessed with Christianity than Paul. And I think of the very loud and outspoken atheists in our world right now, and their mockery and persecution of Christianity really reveals an assuring obsession with Christianity to me and a following of Christianity. It's only a matter of time before God breaks into their life and converts their heart too. And Paul uses this word later in his letter to the Romans and the Philippians to describe his pursuit in life now, especially in Philippians, where he says, I, the word there is the same word as perse uh, persecute. He says, I press on to make Christ my own, since he has already made me his own. So, so Paul has always been chasing after Christ. He just didn't know it until that moment that God revealed it to him in a very decisive way. So, uh, as you, you come forward today to follow Christ or chase after him, I pray that that would be um, an effective chasing, that you'd realize that Christ has already been chasing you your whole life, and I pray you would meet him here today. <laughs>